You're watching Make a Path Presents. This is The Walking Dead, Episode 4, Afterthoughts. My name is Ronnie Hayes. Let's get into this. Uh, I'm going to have to rate this episode a low grade. That's probably going to be a controversial rating. I know there's... Uh, I've seen a lot of hate towards this episode, and I... Now that I've rewatched it, and I made this comment before that it was a good episode, but I don't think it's going to have any rewatchability. I don't think it's going to be rewatchable like that, you know? Um, I take that back. I love it. I think it's a great episode. It's something I've been waiting for since season three because I've loved Morgan. And that could be a bias because I love the actor so much. I've been a fan of his work before The Walking Dead. But since season three, I wanted to see Morgan come back into the story. And then when we seen him in season five, I was very interested to see what everything stood for. Uh, first thing I want to say is I love the blur effect in the beginning when, when we entered this episode and I love how it like pulsates during the music and I did say in the past I hate the blur effect when they're doing a flashback but I think the way they utilized it here um, showing his his breakdown state you know his P, uh, post traumatic stress um, state of mind I think it worked very, very well, and that works later in the episode, too, when he's facing off, or I'm sorry, when Eastman lets him out of the cage, and he's fine, and the screen goes blurry, and he attacks him. I think they utilize that perfectly, uh, the blurred effect. And we see right away where Eastman knocks him out, and he says, I'm sorry, and Morgan did the same thing with the wolf in the past. I love how that came around. Uh, Eastman's what's your name uh, kill me that's a stupid name you should change it friggin hilarious I mentioned that in the other video but I just need to mention it again I still enjoy that, that little line and I rewatched this episode twice now so that's three times altogether and I still love the scenes uh, in the music just everything draws you in now real quick Eastman says speaking about him getting out of the cage Eastman says a hint of his backstory, Eastman's backstory, with the guy he killed later in the episode or talked about. He said, I threw the key in the river a while back. That's a little piece to Eastman's backstory. Now when we rewatch this scene, we understand. We're like, oh shit, that's when uh, he starved that other guy and he threw the key in the river. So I love rewatching certain uh, episodes and you just pull more from it. The added time for Morgan to get a standalone episode episode and then also giving him a 90 minute time slot was warranted in my opinion. I do not consider it filler. I fully support this uh, episode. I thought it was absolutely great. Now the only things, uh, there was a couple small things that took away from this being a great episode and one of them was the bite that comes later on. I thought that was a little bit weak. Uh, well, it was pretty weak. It was weak enough to knock off a couple points. And it, it just did not feel genuine enough, uh, authentic, for Eastman to get bit the way he did. But speaking of the sound, uh, when Tabitha's in danger, when they do that whole scene between Morgan and Tabitha, he looks at the walker, and the walker's wearing like a wedding ring. And the blurry effects come on him really strong, the post-traumatic, because it's bringing him, uh, you know, memories of his wife and everything that's happened to him. And it's bringing that shit back on to him. When he hears the goat, he looks over to the goat and it breaks him out of that. So the goat for me was kind of like a visualize, visualization of uh, Morgan's healing and, uh, you know, other stuff too, symbolically. And I felt like that is very powerful later on when we see him wheeling the goat over because they're going to bury the goat and Morgan's now going to move on, you know, because the goat was that uh, symbolism for Morgan's, uh, you know, first steps into healing and becoming uh, or conquering this, not conquering, I should say, but uh, healing in a way. We have a funny scene where Eastman holds up uh, the tip. He says, I fixed your tip. Now, the first time I saw this episode, Eastman was like, oh, I fixed your spear, and he held up the tip. And I was like, man, that's a small spear. What the hell is that, you know? I didn't get that the first time. Uh, but yeah, if you rewatch it, he holds up. He's like, I fixed your spear. And he holds up the tip of it, the sharp tip. And Morgan gives him this look like, you son of a bitch, what did you do? And then he gives him the staff. And uh, <laughs> I like that little scene there. Now, when we go over the montage of Morgan's um, growth and healing, we hear the quotes, uh, what we've done, we've done. We move forward with the code, never to do it again. If you go back and re-listen uh, re to what's said during those montages, uh, that's... Uh, 
it's very, very key into understanding Morgan. And you have to understand that this probably took place over a few weeks, maybe a couple months. So this resonates very deeply within Morgan. Uh, you know what I mean? It's not something he's just going to get to Alexandria and totally forget about. This was, you know, the beginning of what brought him back to uh, being not a crazy son of a bitch. It brought him back to normalcy uh, in this messed up world. So this is, you know, he is emotionally invested into his philosophy now of all life is precious. It's not just four words to Morgan. It is is the thing that heals healed him you know what I mean so it means something to Morgan a lot in fact now I want to clear up something I've seen a lot of people uh, get wrong is the story of the man who killed Eastman's family now throughout the entire episode you get little pieces of it and then he sits down and he tells Morgan what happened Eastman has that difficult job dealing with murderers and prisoners and he said he was on his eighth beer, I believe, and he, he was crying. I guess he had a bad day at work. And his daughter catches him. Now his daughter gives him the rabbit's foot for good luck. And the next day, Eastman finds a flyer for uh, a keto. Now he uses the Aikido for like meditation and for coping with the stresses in his life and with his job. And for those who are not into martial arts, I took martial arts when I was younger, uh, and it, it is, it's powerful. It's tremendously powerful for dealing with uh, just respecting life. A lot of people think it's just learning how to fight. It's not. Uh, there, there's so much more to it like that. So I completely um, understood where he was coming from, Eastman, as far as doing the martial arts, not for self-defense, but for a way of life, a better way of life. And anyway, things get better for Eastman, but then he's attacked by this piece of shit at the prison. And because of everything that just happened, like I said before, everything, how it played out, uh, he was able to do an arm bar counter, which is, uh, he says, being choked from a pin position. Which, so it's like interesting how we get this little tidbit about Eastman where, uh, you know, he was breaking down, his daughter gives him the rabbit's foot, which leads to this, which it just fleshes out that character more. And uh, I thought it worked absolutely well. Like I said, we get to the bite mark around this part in the story, and it was weak. Also, I want to add, I am not a fan of the squishy heads. That dude, that walker was only probably, what, a couple months old at the most. And he, he just stuck a pole right through it. I can see if it's one of the rotted walkers. Yeah, that's fine. But I don't know. I'm not really buying the, even in a temple, a soft spot. I'm sh Maybe it could be done. I'm just not buying it. But that's something in The Walking Dead I was never really a fan of. But I don't really mind it. So to break this down, Morgan got the rabbit's foot from Eastman. And that was at the end. He gave it to him for good luck after he was bit. And he got... Uh, the Goo Goo Clusters, this is basically a, a snack. That's something they, that he had a lot of that they ate throughout the episode. I never had a Goo Goo Cluster, so I had no idea what the hell it was. And these are the three items we see in Season 5 when he kneels down to pray at the church. And then he has the bullet. And again, the bullet symbolizes what uh, was the final thing that snapped him back after Eastman did all that healing and helped him. And then he lost his shit again after uh, Eastman got bitten and he went up to that couple in the woods that snapped him back. So that was a reminder. All of those things were a reminder for Morgan and helped him on his travels, maybe to give him hope or just comfortable, you know, possessions for him to have. Uh, and I do want to say the couple that they found in the woods, I know some people are going to think this is ridiculous, but that is not the same couple that Rick and Carol saw in season five. Uh, the couple, the girl died in season five. You see her leg. She's been, she's been eaten. The guy dies at Terminus. He's the first one to get his throat slit. I must have seen like 50 messages where everyone is like, oh, it's the same couple. Guys, it's not at all. The, the other couple is totally dead. <laughs> And guys, I just want to add here, I said this in my last video, that Eastman, to me, it like pays homage to one of the co-creators of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, who the turtle that played Donnie is the person in real life who helped Morgan with the bow staff. So I love how that was uh, in this video, uh, this, this episode specifically. Now, another th silly theory I want to squash right now is the wolf at the end. 
he does say that he wants to kill all the children and everyone else in, in Alexandria like uh, Eastman's family. He's like your friend Eastman. Now that, he, the wolf is not the guy who killed Eastman's family. He's only saying that uh, as an example. Um, the guy who killed Eastman's family is that Dallas Crichton something. We see his grave in the gravesite and he tells Morgan he starved him and killed him and it took 47 days. Uh, so I want to you know clear that up I've seen that a lot too which I don't know uh, sometimes it helps to rewatch it you know if you, you miss something and you have a crazy theory rewatch it and double check it with that but uh, the graves in my previous video I did talk about uh, I love how he shows them respect because everyone sees them as monsters the walkers they're just monsters and it you know everyone just kills the monsters Eastman carves a name for the tombstone for the cross when they don't have a name or a license you actually see two or three graves that say Jane Doe so he puts you know Jane Doe John Doe but he, he you know it's that um what did I say before he and I said this in a previous video and the reason I'm bringing it up now is because uh, people some people didn't understand what I meant when I said that like he honors them by burying them and I didn't really mean it like he honors them because he buries the guy who murdered his family too but I mean like he gives them the dignity of getting a funeral, you know what I'm saying? And yes, he does do that for the guy who killed his own family uh, because he regretted killing the guy who uh, killed his family. He said it didn't help at all. It would have been better if he never killed him, you know what I'm saying? Uh, some people are just not built to kill and he could not deal with that. It, uh, you know, it, it affected him so much that he adapted all life is precious and he made a promise from this point forward never to kill a living thing again and yes the Eastman's grave is there so I love the idea of Morgan finishing that cycle burying Eastman and then going off uh, to find Rick and them uh, now another thing I hear a lot of people asking why didn't Eastman's uh, prisoner turn and if you actually listen to Eastman he gives a hint that I didn't hear the first time he says that he starved the guy, took like 47 days, 47 days. Then afterwards, Eastman lost his shit. And he told Morgan, he's like, I was where you were. And then after that, he actually says, when I decided to settle things, you know, so after he got better even, he decided to settle things. So this could have took months, you know what I'm saying? That's when he went to the turn himself in and he realized the world uh, is a mess now. So it is, it is very possible that the guy Eastman starved to death never even turned because he probably died a month or two before the outbreak because he starved him over a month to begin with. And then afterwards he was, you know, messed up. I'm sure it wasn't a week, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it was probably a couple months he was just messed up over this and then after uh, he even healed himself time went on and that's when he wanted to turn himself in so I think that's why uh, the Crichton guy didn't even turn but anyway this is an afterthoughts we took an in-depth look of anything if I missed anything check out my previous first impressions video I know I covered some of the same stuff here and there uh, sometimes I don't like doing that to repeat myself. Some things I just wanted to comment again. But I do apologize if this video is extra long. <laughs> Thanks for sticking in there with me. If you have any thoughts or opinions about this episode in particular, uh, if you really liked it, if you didn't like it, just let me know down in that comment box below. I'm done talking. It's your turn. Subscribe now.